for vector product. So far, we learned how to add vectors and how to subtract vectors, which is adding negative opposite direction vector. So those and conceptually, you can still think like that because if there's a force going this way and forces are typical vectors, there's another force this way. I mean, like Star Wars force kind of thing. And then the resulting force is the vector sum of the two. That way, right? This is F. Oh, Hartman's plus F2, isn't it? Yeah, that's nice. And then you know what that looks like too. And amazingly, if we just add the components and that just works out, it happens, right? We observe that, so that's great. How do you multiply vectors? Right? That is a new concept now, isn't it? What does it even look like? How do you multiply? I mean, you can multiply the force by a scalar. So if this is F, if you multiply by 2, this whole thing is 2F. You scale the force. You know what I'm saying? That's why the scalars are called the scalar. This is a scalar. You know what I'm saying? You stretch the, you double the force. So multiplying vector by a scalar will scale the force. So that's great. But how do you multiply two different vectors conceptually? Of course, last year you learned about dot product and cross product. Right, but that's just some meaningless mathematical symbols playing with components. So, but what does it look like? What in the real life looks like that and behave like that? That we have to get to the bottom of, right? So those are together called vector products. Okay, so let's get two different type of vector products. But first, dot product. Uh, those of you taking physics, maybe you heard about this concept of work. Work is what times what? Your force times distance or displacement. This is it distance or is it displacement? That's the first question. Is it well, this well, or is it this? Yeah. Right. That that itself is a uh, harm, right? OK, so let's see if I want to force somebody. Usually in a classroom, I can demonstrate this. I usually pick the smallest girl and biggest guy. But imagine, so I shove the smallest girl and she's like, she gets pushed backward, right? See, if I apply a force on a body, that body moves, right? Then I have done work. If I push bigger guy, I won't be able to, I mean, it requires more force to move in with the same amount of acceleration, right? So I've done more work. That makes sense to you? So amount of work definitely depends on the force. However, if I move the same body twice as far, that's also double amount of work, isn't it? So it has to, it has to do with one of these two things, but which one is it? is the question. OK, now say if I push a big guy and that guy pushes me back and is a lot bigger than me and stronger than me, then I get pushed backward. How much work have I done? Is it positive or is it negative? That is in physics negative work. You try to do, so. have you ever like with a good intention, intention try to do something good and then it backfires and then yeah, like everybody's blaming you kind of thing? That's the negative work, right? You See, for that reason, your effort on the test means nothing to me. You have to show bare fruit. You have to step into the positive direction and then start doing these things correctly. Otherwise, like you try really hard and you try to put a LN of something down. That's negative points. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's perfect analogy. So if you go backward, opposite direction of your intention force, that's negative work. So it's not distance, it is really displacement. So that's the first concept, okay? 
OK, having said that, then I will create a little different scenario. Say there's a floor, airport floor. OK, and then here's your luggage. So your luggage looks like that. And then you're dragging this, but you don't really squat down and pull that thingy. You actually put it, pull it at an angle. Let's say your force is being exerted in that upward, upward direction. That makes sense to you? So this is your force. However, it's not like luggage is going to take off and fly in that direction, right? It only moves in this horizontal direction on the floor. So the direction of your luggage, your back, is moving in that direction. You know what I'm saying? So that we'll call it delta, delta R, because we are already in 2D, 3D by today. Okay, delta R. Now you can see not all of this is doing the work, right? So now we have to amend this. I'm going to write it here. So this force, I mean, this work has to be not all of it, just this much component. You know what I'm saying? So what you need is this much. That is called the usually X component. You know what I'm saying? So we'll call that F of X. Good. So this is F of X times the displacement. Eh? That makes sense to you? Now, all we have to do is that, well, with a trick, right triangle trick, and if I call that angle theta right there, then you can compute this component. Is it F cosine theta? Right? So what we have here is this thingy. I'm going to just go back to black. Now this is F for delta R and cosine theta, isn't it? And this is how physicists define what work is. And this is also how they define what that product is. OK, and it makes sense physically, right? Because we can split this into other component. There's this Y component too. Let's put it right here, right? That vertical component. We'll call this FY. And this is F sine theta, isn't it? And this part is being wasted because you're not lifting the luggage up. Good. Okay, that makes perfect sense. How is that related to the dot product that you had last year, right? Let's go up and then do this a nice little exercise. Somebody take out a calculator and calculate F times the dx 7.08, 5.01 times 7.08. And then I measured that angle to be 45. I set it up like that. So somebody calculate that F dx cosine 45 in degrees. OK. And of course, somebody take a dot product of these two vectors. 4 times 7 plus 3 times negative 1. Then what do you get? Uh, um, uh, the product of F and F is like 25, 5, 8, 8, 1, 6, and mm -hmm. then the product is 25. Wow. Wait, you mean they are the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Like point away. Yeah, the useless students who didn't bother to do what I told you to do. Here's the correct answer. Right? This thing times this thing, cosine 45 is 20, almost 25. 
And then if you take a dot product, that's 20. Can they be the same thing? What mathematicians define as a dot product, which is multiplying X coordinate together and Y coordinate together. And if there's a Z component, then multiply Z components together and add them up. Could that be same thing as magnitude, magnitude, cosine, theta? I mean, you had to memorize that last year, right? But why? Why are these things same? I mean, this one is not exactly same, but this is called the truncation error of the calculator or computers, okay? Because these measurements are not that exact. Dang, huh? Okay, so this thingy must be same as our math book's def definition of dot product. And that's mathematical definition of dot product, okay? Well, I guess we shall see the proof today. How about that? Okay. Here comes the proof because you should at least see these things once in your life. Okay, so I'm gonna draw two generic vectors. Say one vector goes out that way. Okay, I'm gonna make this thing. Ah, let's just go with black, boring colors. And then let's say another vector goes out this way, like that in that random angle, okay? Okay, let's name these things. Shall we name this thing vector? Should we go with A, B, C or F and, and vector A and vector B or do you want me to call it F and delta R? Okay, generic A and B it is. So this is vector A and then vector A as yes, component then, let's say AX, AY and AZ. Zoom in a little bit so you can see better, good. And this thingy is vector B. And then guess what that components are? BX, BY, and BZ. Good. Okay, now we are going to perform vector subtraction, okay? That I'm gonna do it with a different color. So let's A minus B. Do we all know that A minus B looks like this? Do we all know that much? Let's think about this logically. This vector plus that red vector is equal to that vector in vector diagram, isn't it? That must mean this red vector is A minus B. You get it? Okay, oh, oh, I can rotate this tablet around and still write it. So this is vector A minus B. And let's write that component and that must be AX minus BX. Let's go. AY minus BY and AZ minus BZ. With me? Say yes. Okay. Now we're going to need magnitude of these vectors. Okay, so let's write the magnitude of these vectors. Okay, last year your pre calc book had this annoying double absolute value, and sometimes this thing is called norm, which means length of the vector or absolute value, whatever, right? Okay, and then some other books actually use single absolute value like that. Or many, many physics books just do this. That means the length of the vector, a magnitude of the vector or norm of the vector, which is the simplest way, which way do you want it? Okay, I'll just choose it for you this way, simplest way, okay? This thing means magnitude, which means it's critical than ever not to forget that vector symbol, right? Harpoon or arrow, okay? Because like this means magnitude and this means the vector itself, okay? Now, this is like a lot of physics people do this. Is that how we take a magnitude of a vector? Right? Distance formula thingy? 
come on, we did it during the arc length thing. OK, then let's write down the magnitude of B. I'll do it here, the square root of Bx square plus By square plus Bz square. So far, so good. OK, what about this A minus B? That one we actually have to, we cannot drop it because that's this magnitude minus that magnitude. So this one we have to be careful and actually write that. Now let's go with a single instead of double absolute value, which is really, really annoying, right? Okay, and that just looks like this sense formula. So that's AX minus BX squared plus AY minus BY square plus AZ minus BZ square. Okay, the initial setup is complete. How do you like it so far? Are we good? Is that too much confusion or can we, do we understand what's going on so far? We haven't started the proof yet. Okay. Now, then, hey, we do you remember what law of cosine was? If I call this thing C, then C squared is equal to, let me write it down. So A minus B, vector, vector, this thing is squared is equal to, what was it? A squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine and angle of oh, all that data, right? This is what law of cosine was now, wasn't it? Okay. Well, we can substitute these magnitudes now. We have it, right? Okay, let's substitute. So we have on the left-hand side, I will have a x minus b x squared plus, I'm going to zoom in a lot more now. Ah, can you see anything? A y minus b y squared plus a z minus b z squared on the left hand side. Are we good? Right hand side, we have a squared a. This thing does not want to scroll. A is right here, right? So that thingy. So we have AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared. And likewise, magnitude of B will be BX squared plus, I'm um, squared thingy, because we lose the square root. BY squared plus BZ squared. Eh? So far, so good. And then I'm going to leave this to AB cosine theta. How are we doing so far? Okay, let's recap. So this left hand side is just that thing is square right there, right? Uh, this side C of the law of cosine C square. And then that thing is square, A square is here. And that thing EB squared is right there, and then that minus 2AB cosine theta is there. At this point, it brings an interesting question. Do you know how to prove law of cosine then? Oh. At the end, if time permits, then I'll prove it for you too. I mean, it's a beautiful story. There's a story that goes with it. Okay, but for now, let's just finish this, right? Okay, assuming you accept log cosine and unthinkable, we have to square these things out. <gasps> no, tell me it ain't so. Yeah, it is, we're about to do it. It's not that bad, okay? So square this thing out. So we have AX squared minus two AX BX plus bx squared, how are we doing so far? Are we good? Okay, plus 
Uh, do I want to write it sideways? Yeah, I'll take it right sideways, downward, ah, sideways. Plus ay squared minus 2ay by plus by squared a and plus az squared minus 2az bz plus bz squared is on the left hand side. Too much algebra? Are we okay? Okay, and the right hand side, I'll just copy. Of course, this thing being a computer, I can do this. Okay, it worked beautifully. And move it here. So far with me? Now, there are a few things that appear on both sides. Let's start canceling these. AX squared here, BX squared here, AY squared, which is here, BY squared, which is here, AZ squared, oh, I got the wrong one, AZ squared, and BZ squared. They're all there. You know what I'm saying? So cancel these things out. And then whatever's left, they all have negative two in front of it. Do you see it? Negative two, negative two, negative two, and negative two, right? Divide both sides by negative two. So what we have is AX, BX plus here, AY, BY plus, and here, AZ, BZ is equal to A, B cosine theta. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. A, B cosine theta, that's kind of what we wanted, right? That's what you're used to. What is this thingy? Is that thingy A dot B? According to math book's definition, multiply X component of A and B, Y component of A and B, Z component of A and B. That's what we call dot product now, isn't it? Oh my. And that is equal to A magnitude, B magnitude, and cosine of the angle between two vectors. Bang, it's been proven. And this is a big deal. It's really, really big deal. You get it? Okay. Now, having said that, then how do you show that angle? How do you find the angle between two vectors? It's just manipulation of this now, isn't it? So consequently, cosine theta is equal to A dot B over A magnitude and B magnitude, right? I mean, we don't have to memorize those two separately. If you know one, and then you know the other. How about that? Are we good? Okay. Wow. How about that, huh? So we don't have to memorize this. We can prove it each time. Okay, then what is a cross product? Cross product, uh, since we don't need it at the moment, I'll just uh, give you what I have on the Dropbox note, okay? Cross product is, and then just give you a little brief overview. Okay, I'm gonna make it appear here. Okay, here's a proof of whatever. Oh, wow, this thing is now mis really misbehaving. Okay, in a nutshell, what this thing proves is, oh, actually, I haven't put the whole thing. Okay, 
it appears here. Okay, what this whole thing just proves is that if you have two vectors, this time I called it R and F, R cross F magnitude is same as R magnitude, F magnitude, and then sine of the angle in between. You kind of learned how to do cross product last year, but you don't know what that physical interpretation is, right? Uh, it has to do with the torque in physics and many other things to follow under cross product, but we really don't have time to get into that. So it's like one of these days, I will give you the overview of what cross product is. Okay, I mean, next year, definitely. I take extra time and dedicate a whole section into cross product. But this is like, it is what it is. I mean, there's a proof whether you want to buy it or not. Okay. Okay, then we still have time for law of cosine proof. You want to see that? Yeah, let's prove law of cosine. Okay. Okay, now I was teaching, I mean, when I was teaching in LA High, I was tutoring this kid. And then, well, for S82 at the time, and then one of the problem required the law of cosine. So I showed him, okay, this is how you use law of cosine. Let's call this I C. And so this is C, we'll call this A. So this side is A and this side, this angle is B. So this side is B and that angle is, well, angle C, right? Then he was a very good student. And then he asked me, but how do you prove that? Oh yeah, easy. And then I drew this right triangle. Okay, and then we'll call this altitude H. Good. And then I got stuck. So instead of, I'm, because I'm charging him by the minute, so I did not want to really struggle over this. I said, okay, I'll think about it. And now, like, by the way, you don't understand this about me. I never get stuck. Okay, this is very embarrassing, especially if I get stuck in a tutoring session. So it's like, I'm going to let you know next week. As I was driving home, this thing was in the back of my head. It bothered me quite a bit. And I came home and I didn't really think about it. Okay, let's just eat dinner. Then I went to bed. Then I had a dream. I was in my classroom, LA High classroom, alone. There were no students, but on the whiteboard, there was this very triangle that where I got stuck. I mean, it bothered me enough to have a dream about it. And what I'm about to show you is the content of this dream. Okay, let's see. Wow, well, let's just name this side. What do you want to name it? X? X is good, right? Okay, then this side becomes B e minus X, A. Eh? Right. And then we have Pythagorean theorem. So we have C squared is equal to H squared plus B minus X squared, A. Eh? You want me to prove that? I'm going to go backward in history again and prove Pythagorean theorem for you because I can do that really fast too. But assuming you know how to do it, big assumption, I know. Okay, then we just created H and X. So all we have to do is just substitute that out. Okay, this is how these derivations work. So A, from this triangle, you see that sine, sine C is equal to H over A, A. And that tells you H is equal to A sine C. And likewise, cosine C here is X over A, right? And that should tell you X is equal to A cosine C. And substitute it out and let's see what happens, okay? So that C squared is equal to, this is A squared sine square c plus b minus a 
cosine c quantity square leg. Say yes. A square sine square c plus b squared minus 2ab. Here we go to a b cosine c and plus a squared cosine square c. So far so good. Scroll down. Somebody tell me what this thing is and this thing is add up to. I'm going to write the rest of them. It's just g squared. That's a squared, isn't it? Wow, look. Log cosine, eh? It comes out of Pythagorean theorem. Then I woke up and said to myself, of course. It was a dream. And looked at the clock. It was five o'clock in the morning. And I did not bother to write this down because it's so, it was such a vivid dream and it was such a beautiful dream. I can play it back like a video to this day. And that was like more than 20 years ago. Wasn't that a beautiful dream? I know, I had a dream. I had a dream when I was sitting and yeah, I God, I should write a speech that goes with this dream. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's look at number seven. So we are looking at number seven now. So what do we need to do? We have to number one, eliminate, right? So part A. Let's eliminate this, this thing into have a regular like X, Y relationship. So this thingy means when you have some, this thingy is your X of T. You know what I'm saying? And then this thingy is your Y. Good. So I'm going to write it like this. X is equal to secant T and your y is equal to tangent t. So far so good? That's kind of what it means. It's the vector function is really a parametric equations. Okay, this is part a. And then why don't I square both sides while I'm at it? Then guess what I'm gonna do? Do we add or do we subtract? How do you know what to do when? Well, it depends on this side. I want this thing t to be eliminated. Do we remember? Oh yeah, trick identity, secant square, tangent square. How do you like? Oh, yeah, like that. That this left hand side becomes this, and then right hand side. This is one. If you know your identities correct, say yes. Okay, I'm gonna sketch this thing. So I have, we have this looking thingy right here. Okay, and then this thingy starts when t is equal to zero, secant is one and tangent is zero, isn't it? So this will have a starting point right here at one zero. And then you guys know your hyperbola, right? It'll go off in that direction and it comes from the negative side like that, eh? And then of course the other side happens, but within our context, right? T is pi over six. So far, so good. So when T is equal to pi over six, it literally is somewhere here, isn't it? That angle this thing makes from the origin is literally pi over six. Okay, so let's Substitute it. What is secant pi over six? And then tangent pi over six. Wait, one over root three, right? That is our point. Are we good so far? Okay, now we have to find B, velocity vector. So velocity vector, of course, is a derivative of this R, isn't it? Uh 
function of t, if you will. Depends on the mathematician. Some mathematicians actually do this, which is kind of, is it annoying or is it whatever, right? And just all this thing tells you is as a function, right? So derivative of this, which is secant t, tangent t, and then i vector. And then the other one is secant squared a. So plus secant squared t, j vector. That's the velocity as a function of t. You with me? Now, at particular point, when you plug in pi over six, because that's what we are, oh, that's ugly six. Okay, then we just plug in pi over six here, right? So secant pi over six was two over root three, tangent pi over six is one over root three, isn't it? So we have two over three. Why is, what is wrong with my handwriting today? 2 over 3 i vector, and then this thingy is 4 over 3 a, because 2 over 3 square, so 4 over 3 j vector. How are we doing so far? I'm going to draw that vector onto this thingy, so that vector happens to be from this point tangent and it goes off in this direction. You know what I'm saying? Whatever that length is. I think it's like slightly longer. Tangent to that curve. This is my V. You get it? Okay, now we have to find the speed. Well, speed is just a uh, absolute value of this, magnitude of this vector. Like that, right? Okay, and that is square root of this thing is square, plus that thing is squared a. Y'all know how to find the magnitude of vectors, like distance formula thingy. Okay, and you're supposed to get to root five over Three. You and me. Okay. Do we have to find the angle? Do they say? Let's find the angle. So, how do you find the angle of this vector, right? I'm going to throw it. I'm going to copy this thing. Okay. This thing goes off in that direction. This is our V. Okay. And then, of course, we want this and this, correct? So when we say this component, 2 root 3, this is Vx, this is 2 root, I mean, 2, two third, you know what I'm saying? And this side is what we call Vy, for us, is 4 third at the moment. You get it? I mean, I direction, J direction. So do you see that tangent of our angle, this is theta, is equal to Vy over Vx. You know what I'm saying? Okay, in our case, this over this gives you two. So that tells you our data, I'm gonna do it this way, our data is equal to inverse tangent of <laughs> inverse tangent. I wrote two there. Inverse tangent of two, which should be about sixty-three degrees. Four three four nine four nine, according to Dropbox note. Good. Who's lost so far? Okay then. D. D is the weird concept. Can we write this V back as speed times some kind of unit vector? What does that even mean? Okay, we'll come back to this, but let me 
briefly explain what that concept is. Suppose we have this vector. We'll call this thing V, same name as our V. And suppose this thing has 4, 3 as a component. Okay. Then what's the magnitude of this vector? Do you see this is 5? So far, so good. Number one, how do you find the unit vector that is in the same V direction? And then instead of memorizing it, I mean, people say it like that, right? What does that mean? We'll find out. Our vector, right? 4, 3, divided by 5, right? And that thing, of course, gives you 4 fifths. And this notation, I don't know. I mean, some teachers hate it, some teachers allow it, but just divide each component. Do you agree that this thing has a magnitude of 1? Shall we compute it? Common denominator 25, and that's 16 plus 9. <gasps> you get it? Does it conceptually make sense to you? If you divide yourself, you shrink your size, dividing by your own height, then do you see your height should be 1, whatever that unit is? That's the idea. Now, can we express this vector for three in terms of unit vector times the distance then? Yeah, well, we'll see. That vector, our u, right? Which is equal to four fifths times three fifths, right? Now, you don't want that length to be one. This has a length of one at the moment, right? And you want to scale it back to five, right? I mean, that's why we call these things scalars because it scales the vector. You know what I'm saying? That's an appropriate name. Well, let's see that vector. If we say five times our unit vector, I'm going to write it as erase unit vector like this. Oh, that head is missing. And that is five times four fifths times three fifths, isn't it? You see, that we get our vector back. But then why the hell would you want to do such a thing? It's a common question. Well, you're already in the mathematician's point of view. In everyday real life, let's say in navigation, people don't think about in terms of vector components. They say our speed is 30 knot and our direction is north, north, west. You know what I'm saying? People think in the magnitude and the angle direction instead of vector components. Vector components are just mathematicians thing. Right? You remember navigation problems last year? Those of you who are doing physics, it's always the magnitude, speed and the direction now, isn't it? And we are going to do that projectile motion thing today. So this is the magnitude. And this is speed. You get it? Oh, speed. This is the direction. That's the concept here. To put it into layman's perspective. And then many times, I mean, people use angle as a direction. But if I write it like this, cosine theta and sine theta. Do you, did you notice that this is a unit vector? If you find the magnitude of this, cosine squared plus sine squared becomes one. So this itself is a unit vector now, isn't it? These are known as the directional vectors. People use unit vectors a lot. It's almost equivalent of giving an angle now, isn't it? Right, within that context, people like this speed and direction concept a lot. I mean, that's widely used physics, engineering, aviation, navigation everywhere. Only mathematicians think like vector component because that's convenient for us, OK? So now we are ready to come back here. OK, so the speed, we figured it out, is this, right? 2 root 5 over 3. 
And how do we find the magnitude of our vector? I mean, the, how, far, how do we find the unit vector? Watch this. Actually, if I write it like this, it makes more sense. Our vector was 2 third and 4 third, right? And divide this by 2 root 5 over 3. And then, of course, you see that this thingy cancels this thingy, so it's the same thing. But instead of canceling it this way, I'm going to simplify this whole thing, and that gives me a unit vector. You get it? Factor divided by its own magnitude. So this turns out to be 2 root 5 over 3, and this thing is root 5 over 5a, right? This over this. And then 2 root 5 over 5. You fully get this concept now? And then you can verify if you find the magnitude of this, it will turn out to be exactly 1. Good. Say yes. OK, we move on. OK, now find the vector. Oh, tangent and normal to this, right? And then the tough thing about this vector function is we have no idea what this thing looks like. Right? But it doesn't matter. We need a point slope form, so we need a point and we need a slope or equivalent direction, right? So let's just do point slope. So we need point. OK, let's find the point. Point is easy when t is equal to 0. So that's just this, isn't it? OK, and that gives you 0 here, and that gives you negative 1. Are you with me? Does anybody wonder why I'm using the vector component instead of coordinate? Or is it, do you know what is going on? Why is that a vector component instead of coordinate? Why are we using that? I mean, short answer is this is a vector, so this must be a vector. You want me to explain that or you got it so I can go on? explain okay these are almost interchangeable let's think last year when we were finding equation of the let's say equation of the space the, the ah i'm fumbling the parametric equation of the line right and then we did something like this say this point is four two negative four two and then say this point is to negative 2, 4, right? And then we subtracted these two and call something called V vector, right? And that V vector was just this point minus this point, wasn't it? Which is 2, 2. And then, yeah, that's a slope of 1. But what justifies subtracting coordinates to create the vector other than it works? What really happened was this. This is the position vector. You get it? For negative 4, 2. And this was the position vector, negative 2, 4. You know what I'm saying? And now, look, it's a vector subtraction, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? So the concept of a position vector is almost interchangeable with the coordinate itself. See, when you say coordinate, it just means that dot. When you say position vector negative 4, 2, it just means the vector pointing towards that dot. You get it? So in this business, this chapter, people use these things almost interchangeably. You have to know within the context which one means. I mean, they mean the same thing. But the way I calculated it is I just substituted zero to this vector function, so that still must be a vector. This vector points towards zero, negative one. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I kind of got attached to this, but I'm going to erase it. Okay, then. Now, we need a slope. Good. So in order to find the slope, I need 
two derivatives, right? So we'll do dx dt. And the x dt derivative of this is cosine ta. Evaluate this at zero while we are at it. So we get one. And then we need dy dt. And dy dt is 2t minus, well, it becomes plus sine ta. So yes. And evaluate that at zero then you get zero. Good. And then our dy over dx, our slope, you see this is a purely um, movement in x direction, isn't it? This motion. Because your y velocity is zero, y motion. You know what I'm saying? Can you feel it like this? So this is zero. Can you write a vector function that does this? instead of a point slope form. Yeah, this, this is a tangent line. How about this, T I vector? You see, it's just this motion, isn't it? I mean, we could have used that, but okay, let's not. Let's get our sanity back. Okay, so our slope is zero. Then can we use point slope form? Yeah, Y minus negative one is equal to zero, eh? So that tells you our equation of the tangent line is y is equal to negative one. Good? Say so yes. Okay, now that was part A. We need part B. Part B is we have to find the equation of the normal, right? Equation of the tangent, well, the equation of the line that's perpendicular to this thingy, right? Usually we take the opposite and reciprocal, except this thing is zero. You know what I'm saying? So we need the undefined slope, correct? Correct. So see, this thingy, equation of tangent is equal to zero. That means equation of the normal has to be undefined, right? So it's like, uh, we have to kind of almost feel it. So we have a point and our point is zero, negative one, right? Let's say this is zero, negative one. And then we need a perpendicular line like that, right? What is that equation? Do you see that equation is x is equal to zero? I mean, the only way we can do this is by feeling it. This is almost like algebra one problem now. You get it? Okay, moving on, number 23. Question? Did I hear somebody asking? Right, number 21, so what do we need? Oh, we just need the velocity and acceleration and find the angle between velocity vector and acceleration vector, is that it? Oh, find the time where this thing, velocity and angle acceleration is perpendicular, because I don't have a questions in front of me. So did I understand the question correctly? Yeah. Okay, good. So velocity vector is a derivative. My piece looks really weird. Velocity vector is a derivative of this vector, isn't it? So it gives you negative three sine t i vector and then plus four cosine t j vector. So far so good. And acceleration vector is another derivative of that. So this thing becomes negative three cosine t i vector minus four sine t j vector a. Now we want this thing to be perpendicular to each other. How do we make sure that vectors are perpendicular? Of course this, right? You take a dot product of the two a. 
So let's start it. Dot product meaning multiplying these components together. So we have nine sine t cosine t. And then you multiply these two together. So minus 16 sine t cosine t. So far so good. And we want these two to be zero. Do we all know why the dot product becoming zero gives you perpendicular or does anybody need an explanation on that? Show hands if you want to see why that is the case instead of just memorizing it. OK. Remember my proof about the dot product. We had this. I'll just use V and A. V dot A is same as V A magnitude magnitude cosine theta. You with me? Now, V and A are not zero vectors, right? So only way this thing could be zero is if cosine theta is equal to zero. You know what I'm saying? And of course, that's a nice trick equation. We know that theta has to be 90 degrees. Ah, that's why. In fact, angle between two vectors was this. And we can just find any angle, but in this case, numerator is zero, so we don't have to really figure out the magnitude of each vector, but 90 degrees. That's why with dot product is equal to zero means vectors are, then the key term, the technical term is orthogonal. Like what's wrong with perpendicular? Why do mathematicians do this to you, right? I know, orthogonal, okay. So we can solve this. We just set this whole thing to zero, right? And these are like terms. So we have negative seven sine t cosine t is equal to zero. You want to use identity or do two things at the same time? I'm going to erase this now. Well, let's use identity. This means this is two sine t cosine t sine two t a. So we have negative seven over two sine 2t is equal to zero, that means 2t is equal to, well, zero, but not just zero and pi a. Say yes. Yes. K pi yes. and pi, whatever, right? You're used to k pi from last year. So then t is equal to n pi over two. How about that? It happens over and over and over. 